In this video, we're going over some of the most overpowered passive abilities and skills in WoW's history. With basically all of these abilities being a passive benefit to a move characters already had in the game, or just an incredible proc chance when using one of your abilities like normal. And at number 10, we have Improved Counterspell. This was a talent added to the game in Cataclysm, which simply allowed a mage to add a 4 second silence to their counterspell ability. Counterspell is the range interrupt that mages have, which has a 24 second cooldown, and locks the character out for 6 seconds if you successfully use the ability mid-cast of an opponent. Interrupts are a staple addition to PvP in World of Warcraft, and timing your interrupts perfectly is how most players are able to finally down a healer, because eventually they run out of instant cast heals to use on themselves, and they'll have to use a cast time ability. And that's where a lot of the strategy in PvP comes from. Being able to properly juke your opponent's interrupts by interrupting your own spell casting early by just cancelling the cast, or moving to the side. That way your opponent will waste their interrupts and you can cast without interruption. However, with improved counterspell, even if your opponent properly juked you, you would still get a 4 second silence, which was pretty good on its own, to the point where you could just use counterspell for the silence most of the time, because it was just easier than trying to time a perfect interrupt if you wanted to focus down a healer. Priests were one of the few other classes that had a ranged silence as well, although theirs is on a 45 second cooldown and only available to one spec. Hunters also had an interrupt called Silencing Shot, which was pretty similar to Counterspell in that it also silenced as well as interrupting while off the global cooldown, and even did a little bit of extra damage, although they removed that and just turned it into a normal interrupt in Cataclysm because that was too strong, even if it was only available to one of their specs. And Warlocks only had an interrupt with one of their pets, so Mages had access to one of the best range interrupts, which also had a baked in 4 second silence for a very easy talent tier to pick up, as it was available for basically all specs to take easily. It was so easy to take that in Mists of Pandaria, they removed it as a talent and just made it a passive for all Mages. Mists of Pandaria is also when CZ was at its highest ever in the game, so it kind of fit in with everything else being broken at the same time, but was still thought to be too strong to stay in the game after Mr. Pandaria was over. So they just removed the passive ability in Warlord to Draenor, and Counterspell is still good even today. It was just even better when it had a passive silence on it as well. And at number 9, we have Throwing Specialization, the rogue talent from Early Wrath of the Lich King. Throwing Specialization in Early Wrath was an updated talent that interacted with their new ability called Fan of Knives. Fan of Knives is an AoE ability that rogues have, which costs energy to use and generates combo points for them, which means as long as they have energy, they can use it as much as they want. And it works very similar to an arcane explosion, where it just attacks everything around the rogue. And since it was a new AoE, and they had a new talent which affected throwing weapons, they thought it appropriate to allow the throwing specialization to interact with Fan of Knives, which simply had the chance that if you had it fully maxed out, it would give your Deadly Throw and Fan of Knives abilities a 100% chance to also interrupt any targets they hit for 3 seconds. Now, Deadly Throw isn't that big of a deal. It's a combo point spender, which uses your combo points in order to throw your weapon at the target for a minor amount of damage, which main purpose was to slow the target at range. So having that ability with a baked in interrupt was also pretty good, but not broken like the Fan of Knives interaction was. Fan of Knives doesn't have a cooldown nor a limitation of a combo point spender. It was a generator, which was a much bigger deal back then. Which means you can use it as long as you have energy, which means rogues had an unlimited amount of interrupts essentially, or at least an interrupt without a cooldown. So if a rogue was on a caster, they could interrupt them as well as their friend next to them and the healer halfway across the room without incurring any kind of cooldown. And in fact, raiders would bring a group of rogues to some of the world first Yogg-Saron kills. That way they could just spam fam and knives on the tentacles and interrupt them in order to trivialize one of the harder mechanics of the fight to constantly interrupt those tentacles in the room. The interaction with throwing specialization in Fan of Knives was probably the strongest forms of interrupts that any class could do in the game's history. There's a reason it was removed after Old War was finished, as in patch 3.2.2 they just straight up removed the ability to interrupt with Fan of Knives. They left the ability to interrupt with Deadly Throw though, which was then removed in Mist of Pandaria when they redesigned the talent trees. If they had a way to get one combo in a caster, they had an extra interrupt at range, which was pretty nice, but wasn't as broken as the Fan of Knives interaction. And at number 8, we have Glyph of Gag Order. A couple of these passives are going to be interrupts and silences, just a forewarning. This was the glyph that modified the warrior's abilities Pummel and Heroic Throw, where it would give them a 3 second silence in addition to their normal effects. 
Pummel is just the normal interrupt for warriors, so having a 3 seconds on top of it was kind of like the improved counter spell, only on a much shorter cooldown, as Pummel has half the cooldown of counter spell at only 10 seconds at the time. And it also affected Heroic Throw, which gave them a 1 minute range silence as well. Although having a 3 second silence every 10 seconds was kind of broken in PvP, they could shut down basically any caster in PvP as long as they had the glyph, and there wasn't very much counterplay. It was kind of a ridiculously powerful form of anti-mage, so the glyph got nerfed pretty quickly. After only a few months in, during a hotfix, Blizzard changed the glyph to just straight up no longer work against players. And then later on they gave the ability an internal cooldown, where it could only occur once every 15 seconds. Because even in PvE situations, having that many silences was still pretty strong. Especially from a glyph. This is probably one of the strongest glyphs they've ever added. Although it definitely has some competition, as you'll see later on in this video. And at number 7, we have Dematerialize. Finally, a non-silence or interrupt ability. Dematerialize was a monk town that only existed in Mista Pandaria, which on a 10 second cooldown made it so all attacks would miss you for 2 seconds after you received a stun. At first glance, this might not seem that broken, until you remember that most people who stun a target in PvP do so so they can immediately pop offensive cooldowns to down them as soon as possible. Or they'll use them when they're on low on health, that way they can finish them off without worry of a defensive cooldown. And also, most stuns are short duration. So if you're basically immune to attacks for 2 seconds after receiving that stun, it completely negates all the interactions with a normal stun. Other than the interaction of using a stun on a target in order to keep them out of the battle so that you could attack someone else. Because a stun is a form of CC which does not break on damage, and is one of the few that do that. It's generally on targets that you want to deal damage to, so not being able to deal damage to them for 2 seconds is kind of a big deal. Especially since it had such a ridiculously short cooldown at only 10 seconds. Monks were basically softly immune to stuns, since people didn't want to use stuns on them if they were just not going to be able to take advantage of the full duration anyway. Over time in Mists of Pandaria, they nerfed the ability by giving it a longer cooldown and turning it into an active ability before they finally just removed it rather than try to balance the pretty strong passive ability. But its original version is definitely one of the strongest passes of all time, only being out by some of the more ridiculous ones that we'll be talking about in a bit. And at number 6, we have Kill Jaden's Cunning. This was a town that allowed Warlocks to cast while moving, and in its first version it was a cooldown ability that if you activated the ability, for the next 6 seconds you can cast and channel while moving on a 1 minute cooldown. It also had a passive effect if the ability was not on cooldown that allowed you to cast and channel while moving anyway, except it imposed a haste penalty on those abilities by 50% and lowered your movement speed by 20%, so you could cast while moving but only at a heavy penalty. Eventually they buffed the ability a little bit and removed the haste penalty and kind of increased the speed movement penalty where it no longer slowed your casting time if you use it to cast while moving with the passive effect, but would slow your movement speed by 15% stacking up to 2 times. So at full blast, if you casted while moving, you were moving 30% slower, which was still definitely worth it. This version of the ability was actually overpowered, as even moving at 70% movement speed while casting was still 10 times better than being able to not move at all while casting, and you could essentially do your full rotation while moving the entire time, making Warlocks the most mobile casters in the game's history. Even if they're moving a little bit slower than normal while doing all that movement. Eventually, they removed the active ability and only allowed people to use the passive effect, where they could cast while moving but 30% slower, since everyone was using it for the passive effect anyway, as kind of a way to try to nerf the ability, although that didn't really do anything to stop Warlocks from casting everything while moving. So in patch 5.4, near the end of the expansion, they changed the ability to only allow you to cast filler spells for the three warlock specs while moving, but with no penalty whatsoever. This version of the spell was meant as a way to stop the mobility of warlocks, but for some warlocks it was considered a buff, because they didn't need to cast literally every spell while moving, and only being able to use their filler spells was more than good enough, and they were kind of happy to no longer have the speed decrease. So in Warlords of Draenor, they redesigned the talent. They completely removed the passive ability to cast anything while moving, and kind of converted it back to the active effect, where, on a 1 minute cooldown, you could cast for 8 seconds while moving with no passive effect at all. Although this version was a little bit too much of a nerf, so they eventually lowered the cooldown to 35 seconds, and then just removed the ability in Legion. But the passive abilities from Mista Pandaria were definitely the strongest, and they have been very careful not to give casters movement that easily ever again. 
And at number 5, we have Maestun Rogues and Warriors. Now, we have two talents at this spot because they kind of did the same thing at the same time period. Where both Rogues and Warriors had a talent called Mace Specialization, where when taken at maximum value, would give them a chance to randomly stun the target for 3 seconds if they were using maces as their weapon. This was a thing in Classic WoW as well, but until patch 1.9, a random stun shared the same DRs as controlled stun, so May specialization was considered worthless since it would just lower the DRs on kidney shot or cheap shot for rogues. After the change, no one really used May specialization either until the Burning Crusade came out and players were given 10 additional talent points. This allowed rogues to go deep in combat and subtlety in order to take up adrenaline rush, preparation, and hemorrhage. Adrenaline Rush was a cooldown which would increase their energy regeneration by 100%, and Hemorrhage was a combo point generator that had the distinction of being the lowest cost combo generator a rogue could take in the game, only costing 35 energy to use. And Preparation just allowed them to reset the cooldown of Adrenaline Rush. So with Mace Specialization, a rogue could just completely ignore using Kidney Shot at all and just spam Hemorrhage non-stop thanks to the energy regeneration of Adrenaline Rush, and basically just attack full throttle without having to use a single global cooldown for CC and just occasionally get in 3 second stuns, which of course would be lowered by the DRs once the next stun came in, but getting free stuns while also doing your full damage rotation was really good. Warriors had something similar, their mace stun worked a little bit differently, where the chance to proc would increase the slower your weapon was, so what Warriors would do is craft a weapon called Storm Herald which was a mace that Blacksmith could make that was a two-handed slow weapon at an incredibly slow 3.8 speed, which is almost as slow as a weapon can possibly get. That also had a chance on hit to stun for 4 seconds. So with mace specialization, their chance to stun with a talent was around 11%. So what warriors would do is basically the same thing, just do their full damage in rotation and just get random stuns while doing their maximum damage. And they could double dip on the procs thanks to Storm Herald. The stun from Storm Herald and the talent did share DRs with each other since they were both random stuns, but you only really needed one to proc for the whole thing to be worth it anyway, and even at full DRs they were still interrupting targets every time you did get a proc. And both of these mace stun combos were in the game at the same time, and they were both kind of nerfed at the same time too. In a late patch in the Burning Crusade, they nerfed the proc chance on the talents themselves, and then Wrath of the Lich King they completely removed the ability to have a random stun proc from the talents and instead converted both of the towns to just give the rogue and warriors armor penetration instead while they were using a mace. Although I think it's kind of funny that two separate classes were both able to separately cheese their mace specializations to be better than they were intended to be by doing two completely different things, and kind of achieving the same results. Rogues would just attack really fast and spam an energy generator, which in turn gave them more chances to proc the mace stun. And Warriors would just craft a weapon which increased their chance to proc and also gave them extra stuns with the weapon, and being as slow as possible to give them the maximum proc chance. It was just kind of a stars aligned moment for both of them. And at number 4 we have Twilight Devastation. Twilight Devastation was basically a random enchantment on gear in the expansion of Battle for Azeroth that only existed at the end of the expansion, where basically, if you damaged things, you had a chance for a laser beam to spawn above your head which would hit everything in front of you for around 18% of your maximum health as damage. And there were two ways to increase the damage of this ability. The obvious one was to increase your maximum health by stacking stamina, and the other was just to get other pieces of equipment that also had Twilight Devastation on them, as instead of spawning extra Twilight Devastations, it would just do more damage to the one that did show up. So a tank that had the maximum amount of Twilight Devastations they could fit on their gear could actually one-shot other players in PvP of Twilight Devastations proc from one of their attacks, making it definitely one of the strongest passive effects in the game. It was so strong in fact, they implemented a nerf to the ability where it no longer hit everything in its path and instead would go away after it hit 10 targets. Because in PvE it was one of the best AoEs in the game's history too, if it was able to hit a large pack of mobs. So a passive ability that was both able to one-shot people in PvP, and do ridiculous amounts of damage in PvE, definitely makes the list as one of the most overpowered passive abilities in the game's history. And since it was available to all classes, it was kind of widespread. And at number 3, we have Shadow of Death. This was a town that Death Knights had at the beginning of Wrath of the Lich King that only existed for a single patch, where when they died, they would come back to life for 45 seconds as a little ghoul. And the ghoul itself had their own little action bar with their own set of abilities, so it was supposed to be bounced around the fact that, sure, you came back to life for a little bit, 
but you were much weaker because you couldn't use all of your class abilities. However, the ghoul abilities hit really hard. They were about as strong as half of a normal player. And of course, they'd also worked in arenas. Death Knights also had a lot of other broken things about them at this time, so if the player finally managed to kill a Death Knight, or the Death Knight just blew themselves up, since that was something they could do as well, they could just come back as a little ghoul who would then finish them off. You basically had to kill a Death Knight two times in order to kill them for good, and they already had a really good toolkit of survivability before they became a ghoul. This ability was too strong to really properly balance. They did try to nerf it by lowering the duration to 25 seconds instead of 45 seconds, but even that was too good, so they eventually just removed the ability during the first major patch rather than try to balance it. And at number 2, we have Glyph of Death and Decay from early Wrath of the Lich King. Now, this one is kind of up in the air, if it's really more overpower than Shadow Death or Twilight Devastation for that fact, but it was really good as well. Death and Decay is a Death Knight AoE ability that they can throw on the ground that just deals damage to whoever's inside of it. The Glyph would give the ability a 20% chance per tick of the damage to fear a target in place for 2 seconds. And Death Knights had ways to make sure you never got out of Death and Decay, as they had early Wrath Chains of Ice, which was basically 100% speed slow, that would slowly give them their movement speed back over time. So it was kind of a root, just without a chance to break on damage. And of course, Death Grip, where if you did manage to get out of Death and Decay, they can just pull you back into it. And for everyone inside that Death and Decay, because remember this was an AoE on the floor, it was basically a mace stun on steroids that affected multiple targets, because the 20% chance was higher than any of the mace stun builds, and Death and Decay would do damage every second. Death and Decay also had a huge radius, so if a Death Knight could just drop it on top of someone, they would never be able to get out of it during the full 10 seconds of it. Especially in small areas like in arena matches. The Glyph of Death and Decay is probably one of the best CCs they've ever added to the game, because even though it's technically a fear and could break on damage and also had DRs, fears don't break on damage immediately. And since it was such a short duration fear each time, it was basically the same thing as being stunned, and you can just get feared over and over before the 10 seconds of the ability ended. The only saving grace was that Death and Decay had a 30 second cooldown, so they couldn't permanently keep you inside of it, and the only counterplay was literally just teleporting away and hiding before it went away. Even though Death Knights on a whole were completely broken in this time period, and they had things like Shadow of Death as well, they thought this glyph was more broken than Shadow of Death, so they changed it before the first major patch. As in patch 3.0.8, they changed the glyph to increase the damage of Death and Decay by 20%, instead of a 20% chance to fear targets. You know an ability is broken when they changed it before Shadow of Death was changed, which is part of the reason I put it a higher spot on this list. And at number one, we have the Reckoning Bomb. After a patch in Vanilla WoW, a paladin was able to use a talent called Reckoning, which gave them a chance every time they were the victim of a critical strike to gain an extra attack on their next attack. So, what he did was get a rogue friend to stab him in the back with a level one dagger in order to generate around 2,000 stacks of Reckoning since it didn't really have a limit on how many it could stack. Then he ran up to a world boss and was able to almost one-shot it, except for the fact that his weapon broke mid-battle and he had to equip another one to finish the amount of auto attacks he had left. And it was one of the first times a player was able to basically one-shot a current tier boss in game, and all from a passive ability. So after this happened, Blizzard hotfixed the ability immediately so that it would only store a maximum of four charges. That way no one else could stack up to 2,000 charges of it in order to one-shot other bosses. So being able to one-shot a world boss and subsequently getting the ability nerfed immediately afterwards it definitely makes it the strongest passive ability in the game's history. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other very strong passive abilities that I may have missed which should have been in the video? If so, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, as well as ideas for future videos just like this one. And also, did you know? Only about 35% of people who watch these videos are actually subscribed to the channel.